Hey guys, it's Kimberly from Keep the Tail Wacking. I am here with Ronnie Lejeune of Perfectly Rawsome and Raw Feeding University. And we are here to talk to you guys about um, micro and macronutrients and a different way to balance the diet. So thanks for joining me, Ronnie. Thank you for having me. Yay. I love the jungle theme going on back there. <laughs> I know, right? I had to move all my plants because I have this really nice window for good lighting. It's and perfect. Now I look like I'm in an oasis. So. <laughs> well, it's like I look like I'm just surrounded by light because it's still dark outside here. <laughs> okay, so um, lately, um, Ronnie and I have been doing a lot of chatter about this, and I built a spreadsheet about... Um, that looks at nutrients and Ronnie has been posting pictures showing how we can balance diets um, using NRC. And I wanted to ask, you know, why is this important? Why is this something that we should start looking at? Well, we do know that our dogs do have minimum requirements for essential nutrients. We do know that. Um, so being mindful and making sure that your diet that you're, you're providing your dog is hitting those requirements is really important because that comes down to making sure our diet's complete and balanced. We always want to talk about complete and balance. Well, those essential nutrients will help you get to that. And yeah, I completely agree. And it's funny because it's like when I started, you know, people tell you, um, you know, your dogs will get every single thing they need in their diet. Don't worry about it. Just try and do 80, 10, 10. What's the, you know, the flaw in that logic? Um, and it's funny, if you would ask me this a few years ago, I probably would have told you there was no flaw, but we all live and learn. I'm admitting to that. Um, we do know 80, 10, 10 is going to be short on a few ingredients. So if we're strictly doing muscle meat from an animal, like a, a cow, pig, lamb, or if we do bone, uh, an organ, no fish, nothing of that extra, you're likely going to be missing zinc, um, magnesium, manganese, iodine, vitamin E, um, omega-3 fatty acids. Um, did I say vitamin D? Nope. I'm not sure if I did in that one too. Yeah. So those are the like quite common that you would, you would see is deficient in an 80-10-10 diet. Now, if you start throwing in stuff like some fatty fish, like sardines, salmon, mackerel, um, you're going to see some changes like it's going to, that's going to provide some magnesium, some, not all, but a good portion. Vitamin D is in fatty fish, which is why I like to feed it because it helps me meet my vitamin D requirements and um, omega-3 fatty acids. Um, and if you also are feeding the whole fish, there's a slight amount of calcium in there. Not a lot, but you're getting some calcium from that. Um, so that will help in that regard. But when it comes down to trying to stick to animal-based products, once you hit that limit, you'll probably start noticing you're going to be playing around with plant ingredients. So that's where um, you could put oysters for zinc <clears throat> or a supplement, or there's Kin and Kine actually has a wheatgrass and Corella super uh, Vita Boost. Mm -hmm. It's actually really high in, in, in zinc. So I really like that. Yeah, it's yeah, super cool. So something different than oysters. So that's really right. Cool. Um, so that's why I like that. So it's just a different way to put it incorporate zinc in the diet without doing like a shellfish because there is dogs with shellfish allergies that we can't even rely on oysters. So mm -hmm. that's pretty cool. That's a good whole food, food supplement for zinc. Um, but things like our manganese, um, you could get that from green tripe. Um, so if you're feeding green tripe, you could you could actually hit manganese requirements with that. Um, and magnesium, you could get that from leafy greens and seeds, iodine from kelp. Mm -hmm. Vitamin E could come from our nuts and seeds, or you could supplement. Yeah. You, could, you notice like certain ingredients, you're going to start getting limited into what we could use to achieve those values. Right. It's interesting because I created this spreadsheet and I sort of just created it um, out of curiosity. And as I was building it, I was like, oh, I'm fine. It's true. Everything does come from the diet. But as I started getting deeper and deeper into it, I found the nutritional holes. And they're the ones that you mentioned, because I started by adding the muscle meat and the organ. And um, the information that I gathered didn't give me the bone percentages. So I just didn't worry about it. But, um, but yeah, there were definitely holes. What about um, fur? What's that going to do for them? 
the data for the nutritional value, there is manganese available in fur, but is it digestible or not? That's the question. Um, but I actually do like feeding that roughage because that's a natural roughage our dogs would be eating. Now, when you talk about our their wild ancestral diet, they're not going to be eating gobs and gobs of pelt and fur. I mean, pelt and feathers. So incorporating a little bit into the diet is great because that's some good fiber, some insoluble fiber. So it's going to bulk the stool. Mm -hmm. So if we have dogs with anal gland issues, that's actually a really good one to bulk up the stool without having to rely on plant ingredients or things like um, xylem husk or stuff like that to get the stool to become bigger to help express the glands. So, and ultimately, I mean, people watching this, you know, some people are going to be ready to start looking at their diet in a different way. People who are brand new to raw feeding, you're not suggesting that they run out, grab the NRC book and start calculating everything. I don't think if you're not, um, if you can't do math to that level and because NRC is not an easy read. It's not a book you could sit down and read like an easy chapter book. This is a science book. Um, so if you're not capable of doing that level of comprehension, then I wouldn't recommend getting the book is maybe getting with someone who's educated to actually guide you that way. Um, but there is resources online. Um, you could get the values for your dog's minimum and maximum and recommended allowances for their essential nutrients. And you could use the USDA food search database to find out what those food provides, what vitamins, minerals, et cetera. And you could hand do the math or there's a program like Pet Diet Designer that could help you along the way formulate a diet. Um, the interface is a little cumbersome for like non-technically uh, savvy people, but if you could work your way around a program, you could actually use Pet Diet pet diet designer and that could help you too um so there's a few options out there for people without having to go spend i think the book is 150 dollars um for some really sciencey data i mean i have the book um but if if it's not something you could sit down and be like oh i could digest and understand this information then don't go spend that money and get that book <laughs> just ask someone to help you <laughs> Yeah. And there are a lot of people um, who do formulate diets. And this is something that you do for people as well, right? Yes, I do. On Perfectly Raw, awesome, I do custom meal plans to NRC standards. Awesome. So when someone looks at like one of your meals, and I know that it can be a little overwhelming because it's like, I got to add all of that to the meal. You don't have to feed all of this on a daily basis, right? There are certain nutrients you can, which you would say, quote unquote, balance over time. Um, the things you want to meet daily are your amino acids, which is your protein, um, your fat, because that's where energy is coming from. So you need your calories um, and your water soluble vitamins because the body does not store the water soluble vitamins. So other things like um, your fat soluble vitamins that could be balanced over time. So your vitamin A, vitamin D, and vitamin E um, could all be like that could be stretched. Out. Um, minerals you'll get like copper, iron, and zinc. Ideally, you want those in itself to be balanced because they can they compete with each other. Same thing like with the calcium to phosphorus ratio. Right. Um, now you can balance some of these over time within. A reason like you can't do balance over time over a month yeah. that that's not going to work like that within like three to five days is what I would say you could do yeah. um that's what balance over time could happen but you're going to definitely need to hit your amino acids your calories and your water soluble vitamins daily like you absolutely need to be um, and it's actually quite easy to hit your amino acids. That that 80% or 70% muscle meat protein that you put in your meal, that's taken care of. Like, you really don't even have to bat an eye at that. Um, Water-soluble vitamins, depending on what's in the bowl, it actually can be deficient. Um, so I actually started recommending people to include heart content in their dog's diet every single day. Nice. Because heart is probably one of the richest sources of our B vitamins. Um, 
And I particularly like pork heart because it's higher in B1 thymine. And that's one B vitamin that can be low in our raw diet. Mm -hmm. um, but I do know pork heart is kind of weird for some people to source. So it really depends on your resources. Yeah. And um, one of the things that I wanted to bring up is that I was told, and this it goes back to what Ronnie said, you know, a few years ago, I thought 801010 was perfectly balanced. And um, I was told back then that if our dog isn't getting it in their diet, they'll find a way to get it. So I don't know if the person telling me this was suggesting that my dogs would somehow go and find it like in the yard or um, if it's going to, their body will just adjust. But for instance, if our dog is low in calcium, we don't want their body taking calcium from their bones because it's going to weaken their bones. And so that goes with all of the nutrients in the diet, which is why this is something that's really important to consider thinking of feeding our dogs this way. What are your thoughts? Um, so you'll have different sides of the coin on this. Well, and we know scientifically like homeostasis. So your body's constantly keeping that balance. You're, right now your body is going to be pulling calcium from your bones to keep homeostasis, but that's why we eat to refuel those tanks, okay. if you will. Yeah. Um, constantly not refueling those tanks obviously see over time that we'll have a tank that's on empty and that's when you start hitting efficiency um so think of it as a gas tank do something like that you want to pour more nutrients into the tank to fill it up whenever we're going on empty so there's homeostasis there so you'll have people that want to say that you got to balance every single day um where you have people that you could have say balance over time um and I would say those people saying that their dog would get the nutrients from elsewhere, I would assume, right, I don't know the appropriate, appropriate information, so my dog's going to get it elsewhere. Yeah, and, but, and at the same time, though, we don't know everything about nutrition. as long. Anyway, it's a very gray area. So I could see both sides of the fence. Um, when people argue, like, the science is here for this, yes, you're right, but the science is not here for that. Mm -hmm. So we have a push and pull in that department. Um, so it's interesting to see where people fall on that side of the coin. Um, I like to kind of be in the middle, yeah, honestly, because um, I do acknowledge that we don't know everything. There's things coming up to this to now, like now where kibble is get, getting recalled for toxic level levels of vitamin D and things like that. So, so finally. Um Tell me, what's one thing that you believed before, but you made an 180 degree change about? Um, it's not necessarily one thing, but maybe the concept of something. Um, the term species appropriate. Uh, I used to be someone that would say that quite frequently, feed species appropriate foods. Um, I've learned to abandon that mentality because there's, there's certain things that we feed that's nutritious for our dogs to complete nutritional requirements that would be quote unquote not species appropriate. Um, and a good example is oysters or um, green lip mussels or um, there is even like specific types of vegetables or herbs that we feed yeah. uh, like garlic. Um, I, you don't, that's not, quite species appropriate, um, but they all have properties that we could use either nutritionally or um, holistically for supplemental reasons or that we need the benefits of some type of compound that's in that food. Yeah. Um, but yep, I abandoned the, the term species appropriate. So you heard it here first. We're not saying it anymore. <laughs> <laughs> no, another one though. <laughs> Thanks, Ronnie. <laughs> Thank you.